All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here with Drew Dinsick. As always, today we'll keep on trucking with our handicap of week four, highlighting some of the teams that played on Monday Night Football. Talk Commanders, Eagles, Bengals, Titans, and Rams at Colts. Let's start with Commanders, Eagles, Drew. The Eagles are eight and a, eight and a half point favorites. The total is 44 and a half. This has been trending towards the Eagles off of the commanders getting demolished by Buffalo uh, and the Eagles uh, demolishing Tampa Bay. Eagles defense look great. The offense is still a little outside of the offensive line, creating massive holes for DeAndre Swift. I mean, Jalen Hurts, 23 to 37, two picks, not really running the ball anymore. He hasn't looked very good so far. What do you make of the Eagles? That's tough, man, because that was a comfortable cover last night. I never really felt like I was never really under stress with an Eagles bet in pocket. Um, at the same time, you're right. The offense is not clicking. Uh, I can't really put my finger on what's going on. I know Hertz is on record that his shoulder, he's still dealing with shoulder pain of some sort and watching last night you know i know there were reports swirling that they had several players had flu-like symptoms including hurts but uh you know he was fine he wasn't especially sharp he made a couple of decisions to throw into some tight windows which were ill-advised um but i was mostly disappointed with aj brown last night what happened to uh you know if you're if you're gonna go out there and do all this belly aching and really kind of try to drum up targets and a role for yourself in, a, in an otherwise crowded offense you better catch the ball when it's thrown to you he had some really weird plays in terms of decisions when he when uh, uh after, you know where he went with the ball after catch uh and then in the red zone uh two very catchable passes i thought that he could have been touchdowns for him that were ultimately landed on the ground so um yeah eagles passing offense i still have huge questions about how exactly you know how good they are really and um you're right that the running attack, uh, you know, is is extremely solid, particularly in short yardage situations. Um, but this is going to be a tougher test, I think, for them. Uh, and you know, it's it's uh, uh, it's relatively straightforward how you want to game plan against the Commanders. I think you want to try to attack their young quarter cornerbacks. Um, but if uh, Hertz isn't feeling 100, percent if his ball is not accurate, if he's making decisions like he made last night, then you know there could be you know a couple more turnovers here. He's got three picks through three games. I think in general, um, you know, that was something that really wasn't part of his uh, makeup at all last year and his, you know, MVP candidate campaign. Um, and so it's absolutely worth watching. Now, the flip side of the coin, and again, like easy cover for the Eagles, but it felt like it should have been a bigger margin. Like really, like they left points on the field, uh, you know, and they, you know, they wipe out the last nine minutes of the game with uh, that spectacular final drive. But, um, you know, they could have, they could definitely have scored into the thirties if they had, uh, things had been clicking. So it's, it's maybe we're nitpicking, but, uh, I don't think they're exactly right just yet. Uh, and then the flip side of, of the discussion here, which is what do we do about this commander's team? Um, you know, it was not a good performance for them against the bills. The scoreboard reflects that pretty fairly. Um, but I also think the scoreboard is a little bit deceiving and that if you kind of look a little bit deeper there, um, there were some late uh, high leverage, you know, not really high leverage, but just desperation drives uh, from the commanders that helped pad the uh, the ultimate score uh, output for the Bills. Uh, the commanders moved the ball at times somewhat effectively, so I think uh, it was a pretty unlucky result, uh, padded by five turnovers and one fourth down conversion. Uh, so basically, a six turnover game. It's that's what the score is going to look like. Um, and I think uh, the interesting part for me here as we look at this game and, and what to expect with this market, Jay, the commanders were bet, man. They got bet pretty aggressively last week. Uh, somebody went to uh, went to bat for them into close against a Bills team that is good. Um, and they no-showed. And the reaction to the result was an opener that was higher than um, you know the look ahead. Uh, I tend to get sucked into these spots betting on uh, a team that uh, market supports that doesn't show up and then the next week there's an aggressive uh, adjustment away from them so um you know sticking to my priors here this should be seven uh if you're going to give me eight and a half with the commanders and you know divisional matchup and an eagles team that's recovering from flu-like symptoms and offensive you know a pass you know, passing offense isn't 100 percent clicking uh chase young getting healthier uh just in general a little bit of a disruptive defensive line to 
um, you know, to look for opportunities to to make game changing plays. I mean, I'm I'm talking myself into this. It's a weak weak edge, uh, but I think the commies at eight and a half is a bet. Yep. Uh, no, I think that makes sense. Uh, I think the most compelling thing about the Eagles right now, from uh, from a betting standpoint, in a way, uh, week to week. Uh, is with the running backs and just like the market yesterday had no idea what to do with uh, DeAndre Swift and Kenneth Gainwell where Swift was set at 41 and a half rushing yards and Gainwell (laughs) was set at 31 and a half. Uh, Swift went over uh, with ease and Gainwell got there as well. But to me, the most amazing thing about DeAndre Swift is that so he's had 308 rushing yards, Drew. 250 of those are before contact. Uh, he's just running through gaping <laughs> holes. He has 5.6 <laughs> yards per contact yeah. per attempt, which is ironically, he's only second in the league because uh, Devin Achan, is, uh, he has decided that he would like to be called. <laughs> he is first uh, after he ran for 800 yards on Sunday. Um, but I mean, the offensive line is the best in football. I think we can say that, particularly with Cleveland um, dealing with injuries on there all-world offensive line. So the, the rushing attack looks monstrous, which is handy because Hertz doesn't look nearly as good. Saw some buzz last night about DeAndre Swift, Offensive Player of the Year. And look, I, I get it because he's had 175 and 130 rushing yards the past two weeks. At the same time, he was in an ideal game script for running mm-hmm. last night, and he got 16 of Philly's 40 rushing attempts like that's just not not enough like he could potentially win the award but something needs to change substantially with his usage can't be having kenneth gainwell getting 14 carries um off of that he does have upside though where if they just decide to make him a workhorse back which i don't think they're going to do given his history given gainwell given hurts if they were to do that um that would get interesting uh what do you think of the commander's defense overall where do you rate them uh, I think their rush defense is better than the Bucks. Um, and I think the Bucks rush defense was exposed a bit last night because they were dealing with a number of injuries, not just heading into that game, but then in the game itself. Um, you had injury, you know, the the Devin White obviously was not 100 percent. Uh, the um, uh, Vita Vea was a question mark heading in, ultimately played, but didn't look like himself. Uh, and then the secondary, you had uh, no Carlton Davis, and then you lose Jamel Dean in game, which I think kind of pivoted the role of some of the safeties where they had to do a little bit more uh, kind of consideration of, uh, you know, the you know the the tight end and and uh, extremely talented wide receiver core for the Eagles. So I think in general, um, the Bucks defense did not show up well last night, and the uh, Commanders defense is uh, a, a bit better in terms. Of, particularly, they were better neutrally in terms of rush defense uh, heading into that game, and I think they can do a decent job of turning the Eagles into a little bit of a one dimensional offense and force Hurts to beat them through the air. Um, now. The pass defense for the commanders is not that good, and that's because they have relatively young uh, secondary, and these guys are still really learning the game. And uh, it's going to be a tough test uh, for them to, um, you know, keep Smith and Brown down. But Smith and Brown again, like it's, it's just not really clicking yet. Um, if this is the game where the Eagles' offense all of a sudden finds their uh, form through the air, um, then the commanders are in trouble. But I do think that uh, in general, the commanders. Uh, you know, have a decent enough uh, set of skill position players that uh, they can attack uh, an Eagles uh, defense that, you know, is, is a little bit relying on uh, favorable game state to this point in terms of how and, and just in general getting a pretty outstanding play from some of their interior defensive tackles. So um, if the commanders are blocking well in the interior, this is a contest. Maybe they're even live. Um, but, uh, you know, there, it's possible that this is a pretty ugly game and, and, uh, that's one of the reasons I kind of like being on the outside of seven as well. Yeah. I'm with you. I don't trust this Eagles team at all. I don't think I really trust any team in the (laughs) NFC. They all have question marks. I mean, the Eagles really could have lost to the Patriots and probably should have lost to the Vikings if they didn't recover all four fumbles in the game, you know, at home to the Vikings on a short week. And then they were much better last night overall and just kind of imposed their will um, at the line. But still some question marks. And also I wouldn't – I think I'm on the more optimistic side of Sam Howell where I know it was brutal against Buffalo, but it was brutal in a way that 
the way that Desmond Ritter is brutal makes you think that like this guy's not a quarterback in the NFL. I don't feel right. that way about Sam Howell. Sam Howell has flashes uh, where he could be legitimately okay. Uh, and certainly I think has the type of profile as well where he's probably higher variance, certainly yeah. than someone like Ritter. Um, so yeah, I, this is, I wouldn't be shocked if the, the commanders won this game given no. the Eagles' flaws and... Um, what Hal has shown in flashes, particularly in the Broncos game, though. Yep. Who knows what to make of games against yeah. the Broncos? Just a little FYI, so far this week, Commander's the only dogs, I bet. Yep. Okay. I like it. Well, bad news for the Titans in our next game. <laughs> uh, but, uh, it's an AFC clash. This Sunday night, Drew catch Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs traveling east to square off with Garrett Wilson and the Jets. Coverage begins at 7 p.m. Eastern, only on NBC and Peacock. Uh, I may be at that game with my father-in-law visiting. All right. In if I can uh, stomach the commute into uh, to MetLife, which no offense yeah. to MetLife, but it's uh, not fun getting out of uh, East Rutherford um, at late on a Sunday night, but may stomach it. Less likely to stomach it now that it's Zach Wilson instead of Aaron Rodgers, but may still do it uh, all the same. I'll keep you posted, Drew. Uh, Bengals, two and a half point favorites at the Tennessee Titans. Uh, Tennessee, what a team. What a team. <laughs> over there is 41 flat at the moment. Uh, we have to start with Joseph Burrow, who did not look mm -hmm. great uh, against the Rams. He did throw 49 times, which is kind of shocking given that it felt like he couldn't plant his leg and he was basically throwing all with his arm and his mm -hmm. upper body. There was no real oomph on those uh, deeper shots, which just kind of sailed the rare times that he threw it downfield, but still able to do enough to get the win. I thought that they were probably pretty lucky to win and relied yeah. on some negative plays from the Rams offense, and we'll get to the Rams. And then on the other side, the Titans, uh, I think the fear for the Titans coming into the year there was that their offensive line was going to be so bad that it just nothing was viable on that offense and uh that certainly reared its head when they had to send multiple tight ends in motion to block miles garrett which was one of the more incredible things i've seen yeah. and one of the greater <laughs> admissions i've seen from a coaching staff that this is how bad it is at the moment uh what do you make of this game uh why is the total over 40 <laughs> what am i missing um I couldn't take a side here. Uh, if the Titans get to three, I would consider it. But uh, the Titans offense doesn't match up especially well here against the Bengals defense where Lou Anaruma is starting to really cook with uh, some of these young pieces. Um, I thought the Bengals missed uh, their veteran safeties uh, in the first couple of weeks, but they are now kind of figuring out exactly how they want to deploy some of their young pieces in the middle of that secondary, and they look good. Um, the Bengals offense, uh, defensive line, uh, was the differentiating factor in that game against the Rams because as soon as they had a lead, um, those guys pinned their ears back and they just made an absolute mess out of pass pro for the Rams in that game. Uh, and while I agree with your sentiment that the Bengals were lucky to get a win, um, and they, the only fortuitous part you didn't mention was they were the beneficiaries of two really weird uh, you know, uh, review uh, decisions. Yeah, Tutu, Atwell did, Tutu Atwell did not step out of bounds. Uh, and uh, Logan Wilson did not catch that first pass without the ball moving when it hit the ground. So I, yeah, I do I not understand. I didn't understand either of those calls, uh, especially the way that they went to video and basically said, well, it's been, it's been, there's re irrefutable evidence and there's no evidence like, uh, okay, all right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm not saying that would have truly changed the game state, but uh, ultimately the Rams, uh, um, we're pretty unlucky with some of the calls. And then on top of that, uh, Stafford had a loosey goosey night, uh, when Stafford's under pressure, uh, sometimes he makes poor decisions, uh, and the Rams, I mean, the Bengals were able to do that without really blitzing other than a couple of exotic first half blitzes. So, um, overall, I think, um, that told, tells you more about the Rams than the Bengals maybe, uh, and the state of their offensive line. Uh, and I think the, uh, the Bengals major takeaways that you really have to kind of dial in on are Joe Burrow's not right. Yeah. How long is it going to take him to get right? How much does playing in this condition risk him having a season-ending injury? These are the questions swirling through my head. Uh, I think going up against 
coached uh, a Mike Vrabel coach team and a defense that has a a more formidable set of pass rushers could spell trouble for Burrow this week. Uh, and uh, you know, if if your game is limited to throwing. 15 yards in the middle of the field, 10 yards on the sidelines, uh, and you're going up against the Titans team that can at least cover that fairly well, then I think you're in trouble in terms of making your team total here. On top of this, this is a short week for the Bengals, so Burrow has one less day to get right after throwing it 49 times, like you said, uh, and I don't think his uh, calf is going to miraculous, miraculously heal itself. So um, this was an easy underplay on the open. I got 42. It's down to 41. That is directionally correct, but not enough of a correct move. I think that uh, anything on the uh, north, anything north of 40 here I think is a bet to the under, uh, and if Burrow miraculously comes out and lights this Tennessee defense up, then... Uh, so be it, because I don't see the Tennessee offensive line being able to keep Ryan Tannehill upright in this one either. Yeah, I agree there. And uh, Monday Night Burrow was negative 0.1 EPA per play, negative 12.6% <laughs> completion percentage over expected. Basically provided no value in his passes through the air. It was all yak. It was all Jamar Chase going to work, which is fine. And he largely, I mean, he mostly avoided really back-breaking negative plays. Uh, I think this is a good game to live bet because this is something that's very difficult for the market to adjust to in real time when there's such an injury uncertainty because last night, after one drive, it was pretty clear that Joe Burrow could not plant his leg and throw the ball deep uh, and really get any power behind his throws. And so that's just what I would be looking for in this game uh, to bet it live is that if Burrow is throwing with confidence deep, then maybe his calf has miraculously taken a turn for the better. Uh, if it hasn't, uh, then you're looking at an under again. Uh, mm -hmm. And that impacts all the live player prop markets as well. Um, and so that's just, it's, it's very difficult for a trader in real time to just be like, uh, Burrow can't plant his leg. That makes the total two points lower. Like there's not really a science mm -hmm. there for that. It's just calculated guesswork. And people in those spots often guess wrong. So uh, that would be the way that I would approach that one. Uh, with the Bengals, just their kind of longer term outlook, they're 18 to 1 to win the Super Bowl right now, plus 350 to win the division. I think their whole season hinges on they have three games before their bye. So they're at the Titans and then they play the Cardinals and the Seahawks. So they'll be favored in all those games if Burrow is fit enough to play them. If they can get to the bye at four and two and then Burrow can come out of the other side of that healthy, then you're potentially looking at a Super Bowl contender. But if they falter or Burrow gets hurt, then the season is effectively over. So he's got three weeks to survive with his calf before he can get some extended rest. Uh, what do you make of that division at the moment? Because I kind of think Cleveland should be favored. I think Cleveland should be favored too. Um they have the easiest. Okay. They have the easiest okay. schedule on top of the fact that they have the best singular unit. They're the yeah. probably they're probably the least flawed team, even though Deshaun Watson is still massive question mark in my head. I don't think you can take away his performance against the Titans and take any you know make anything of that. But other than you know, congratulations for bouncing back. I guess um, the uh, the general read uh, I have is Cleveland should be favored. That would be the bet. We talked about that I think yesterday, and I don't nothing that I saw last night changes my opinion there. The risk of a Burrow season ending injury before they get to the bye is still high. Um, but the bigger question for me about Burrow and the Bengals reaching their goal this year is I, I had pretty high personnel ratings on their entire offensive line starting this season. And that gave me, um, a kind of a, a, a little bit of false hope. I think that, um, you know, that the offense could take another step forward. Um, and so far you're not seeing it largely because burrow has been hurt, but I got to tell you, man, this offensive line is not who I thought they were. Uh, maybe they can generate some push in the run game. It's not going to happen this week against the Titans. Uh, but ultimately, like the pass protection is a huge problem. Uh, even though they've invested all of this, uh, you know, capital in trying to protect Burrow, uh, Burrow traditionally does, you know, play his way into sacks at times. Um, but uh, the pass protection not being. Um, you know, in a top 10 is going to ultimately limit them, even if Burrow ultimately, you know, finally gets healthy, I think. Uh, there are some good defenses in the uh, AFC, man, and there are some good pass rushes. There are some really good interior pass rush, and 
I think we talked about this in the preseason, that being potentially, you know, with the quarterbacks getting the ball out of their hands quicker, uh, you know, some of these matchups of interior D line versus O line are going to decide some things. And right now, the interior O line for the Bengals is rough. And uh, as long as they play that poorly in pass pro, I think ultimately this offense is going to stay grounded. Yeah, it just feels like a Phil Rivers Chargers situation where Joe Burrow is just never going to have an offensive line that is a strength. It's never going to be <laughs> kind of part of the game for him, uh, and you have yeah. to increase the difficulty level. Yeah, he's got a very he's doing a very good Philip Rivers impression in a lot of ways this year. Yes. <laughs> he's literally might as well be shot putting the ball. Uh, yeah. The yeah. the amount of air he's got on his passes ten yards down the field in the sidelines looks Phil Rivers esque if you've ever seen it. Yep, busted calf versus Phil's uh, torn ACL AFC title yeah. game heroics. Um, <laughs> yeah. Looking around out there. Okay, before we get to Rams Colts, a reminder that Bet the Edge isn't the only show every weekday during the NFL season. You can check out the Fantasy Football Happy Hour with Matthew Berry, Connor Rogers, and me. It airs live on Peacock at noon Eastern, re at 4 p.m., and is available on our NFL on NBC Sports YouTube channel as well as wherever you listen to your podcasts okay let's close out with rams colts which is a much more interesting game than it seemed like it would be four weeks ago before the season started the colts are one point favorites the total is a 46 and a half which is almost a touchdown higher than it might have felt like it was going to be um at the start of the season uh the colts two and one somehow uh, they really shouldn't have beaten Baltimore. Uh, holding penalty should have been called uh, on or against the guy defending Zay Flowers, which should have effectively ended the game. Uh, but the Colts get out with the win. Uh, we'll see exactly what happens with the quarterback situation there. But how are you approaching this game? Yeah, uh, I think this is Colts or pass, and I bet the Colts actually sold them out to two and a half here because... Uh, the Rams to me are a little bit more volatile. Like you know, this this is I don't think this is going to be a a closely contested game one way or the other. I think um, there are matchup advantages here for the Colts that if they take it, you know, if they if they fully capitalize on, they should win with margin. Um, this is one of the worst situational spots in the entire calendar for any NFL team. Jay, the Rams have this is now their third rotor in four. Uh, they elected not to stay in the East Coast and get right uh, and prep for this game. They went back to west, to the West, and they will be now logging their third um, relatively meaningful uh, flight in you know prior to a uh, game uh, this early in the season. Uh, on top of it being a short week, uh, so they're at a rest disadvantage and at a pretty substantial travel disadvantage in this contest, and it's an early game as well. So uh, nothing I hate more than uh, seeing a team play. Uh, a late game, you know, primetime game, and then turn around the following week and get uh, the early kickoff slot. Um, if the Rams ultimately like show up and play uh, a high percentile game overall, I will be blown away here. Um, so just kind of keep in mind that my starting expectation is that the Rams are going to come in and give you something like a 16th to 33rd percentile game, considering the situation that they're in here. To make matters worse, uh, we start to look at specific matchups and the fact that the Rams' offensive line is starting to fall apart at the seams, and I don't think that gets fixed on a short week. Um, and uh, the Colts do have somewhat of a strength brewing with DeForest Buckner anchoring this interior D-line. Um, and so the idea of the Colts kind of giving you somewhat of a similar picture in terms of just a violent pass rush uh, getting in the face of uh, Matt Stafford and really disrupting what he wants to do offensively I think is a fair bet. Um, so weirdly, I think the Colts defense can be the distinguishing factor in this one. Um, and, uh, you know, really kind of put the Rams, uh, offense on its heels. Um, the flip side, the Colts, uh, offense kind of just has to play mistake free. Um, you're getting a lot better play out of the offensive line this year for the Colts. Um, I don't really have a read one way or the other if it's going to be the Gardner Minshew show or the Anthony Richardson show. I don't think it matters. I think both those players are pretty closely rated. Um, it's just more of a matter of once you know who you're up against, uh, maybe your game plan is a little different if you're, uh, you know, Rams, uh, defensive coordinator here. So it's, I, the uncertainty of who you're facing, I think actually is another advantage for Colts. Uh, and I think, um, you know, if, if basically if the Colts can capitalize on all this, they should win this one pretty comfortably. Um, do you have any, uh, 
lingering hope that the Rams are surprised to the good here? Uh, not particularly. I think the Rams kind of are what they showed they were last night, which is a pretty flawed team with a handful of special players. And it just depends if you get good Matthew Stafford, uh, then you're going to be in the game like they were against the Niners for the better part of three quarters or so. Uh, if you get that combined with you know Aaron Donald, who looks magnificent, uh, then they're going to be a chance. And I believe in Puka Nakua and once Cooper Cup comes back, assuming he does, that offense could be pretty good. And the Rams' defense has been better than expected. But I think, to me, the Colts are the, are the more interesting team here because I don't really see much of a ceiling for the Rams. I don't really see much of a ceiling for the Colts either, just they play in a much easier <laughs> division and have an easier schedule. So yeah. here's my question to you, Drew. So sure. if the Colts win this game, they'll yeah. go to 3-1 and one and they're favored. And then after that, their schedule is home Tennessee at Jags, home Cleveland, home New Orleans, at Panthers, New England uh, in Europe, and then home Tampa at Tennessee. Like that is an absolute cakewalk relatively. Yeah. I mean, at Jags, home Cleveland, they're not easy, but again, it's not at Chiefs or anything. So my question to you is, it's plus 200, a money line parlay of Bills beating the Dolphins and the Colts beating the Rams. I have no interest in placing that bet, but that's plus 200. If that plus 200 gets up, is Shane Steichen the favorite for coach of the year? Ooh, that's, I didn't know that was where you were going. Uh, but yeah, uh, he's in the conversation without question. Probably co-favorite with McDaniel still. I mean, the glow on McDaniel, the shine on McDaniel right now. I don't even think it's really reflected in the market price. <laughs> like, I think if you really forced a vote right now, he would be pretty much the unanimous choice across the oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, NFL. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, I, uh, you know, Steichen, you know, is is uh, I, I have an affinity for him. I really like what he's doing. I believe in him. Um, but uh, you know, I think uh, you didn't even really mention how favorably the uh the cult season ends <laughs> they get yeah, well, like, a texans lot of raiders at the end right yeah, yeah texans raiders at the end falcons desmond ritter if he's even still the quarterback can he pick it if he's pick it or Mitch yeah, yeah 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 this, uh, there, there is just a there is a uh you got baker mayfield at the end of the schedule here you get a, at tennessee titans after you know you get you, there are a number of really favorable spots here i think the colts getting to 10 wins is very 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 live Three and one makes that even more likely. Obviously, this week is a big swing swing spot to getting to double digit wins. Um, but with double digit wins, Shane Steichen's in the conversation, regardless of what happens to Miami. I think. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm fully on board here. I guess if you want me to break down a little bit more, uh, kind of granularly, what I feel about the Colts with the three weeks of data we've got, I think this is a good defense. Yep. Um, I, you strip out tur turnovers. You know they had some pretty lucky turnover. Uh, you know help help push them up uh, week one against the Jags in terms of just overall rating. Um, but they've been good uh, the last two weeks, and I think um, the offense is still figuring itself out. Um, they're going to have ups and downs, particularly once uh, Anthony Richardson comes back. But they're not. Uh, they, you know if if you can protect, particularly in the middle of the uh, the offensive line, if you can give him. Uh, you know you know just stave off the violent uh, you know defensive tackles across the league. Then um, you know you can score twenty points a week, and I think that's really what they're going to have to do against the schedule of pretty weak quarterbacks. So um, yeah, Colts getting to ten wins, I think, is very live. Yep. And look, I agree. I think Mike McDaniel, unless they get absolutely blown out by Buffalo, I think McDaniel will be favorite for coach of the year and justifiably so whatever happens this week. But with Steichen, the thing is, is one, I agree. I think the defense is good. The defense was good last year and I thought it would be right. bad this year because they lost Gilmore and Isaiah Rogers and they didn't really have any cornerbacks. But Kenny Moore's playing well. Dallas mm -hmm. Flowers appears to be solid. And then they have a really good defensive line with DeForest Buckner and Ambu Cam and Grover Stewart. Uh, and I think they're well coached. And Shaq yeah. Leonard is back. Shaq Leonard. Um, yeah, he yeah, matters. Shaq Leonard didn't play last <laughs> year. So yeah. he's, you know, he's been historically the best player on that defense. I think he's quite at that level at the moment, but he's still mm -hmm. an upgrade on what they had. The issue yeah. is that I, Minshew's not good. Uh, no. <laughs> Minshew is not very good at all. No, he's not. <laughs> uh, and, I mean, maybe he has a higher floor than uh, Richardson, but there's no ceiling whatsoever to Minshew. Yeah. He was bad against Baltimore, and they yeah. really should have lost that game. But the defense held what should be a pretty good Baltimore offense, in theory, to uh, by Kevin Cole's number at unexpected points, a 
22nd percentile offensive performance from the Ravens. So I think the Colts' defense is good. I think Michael Pittman is a really good receiver and he kind of bailed out Gardner Minshew. And then you have some upside with Richardson. And so if you think that, you know, the Bills win the division over the Dolphins, the Colts might not even be that good. And with that schedule, they could still kind of luck their way to 11 and 6 in the division. Like that's not likely, but... It's uh, that is a lot, lot shorter than Shane Steichen's. You know what else, Jay? You know yeah. what? You know what feels pretty good. Mm. We're three and one. Guess who's coming off IR, Mister Jonathan Taylor? Uh, so for the Colts, think, he's gonna yeah. play for the Colts. I, I mean, I, the situation looks a lot brighter now. You know, the the vibes are better. I, if you're sitting, if you're standing back, you're like. I like this, I like what this coach is doing. We're winning, feeling good. I want to be part of this. Uh, you know, I think uh, you know the contract stuff and however he feels about the owner. You can kind of set that aside because uh, if Taylor misses uh, a huge chunk of the season at this point because of just attitude, I think that ultimately affects his bottom line a lot more than um, you know he would ultimately be interested in. So um, no, I I think Taylor comes back and, you know, kind of has a good soldier mentality here uh, after week four, particularly if this team is three and one. Yep. The thing as well I like about Steichen is just that he's got a lot of narrative around him. Like after what he did with the Eagles last year, everyone knows who he is. He has the respect as kind of this QB whisperer guy who turned Jalen Hurts into an MVP candidate. And then if he's able to succeed after, you know, Jeff Saturday last year and John, the Jonathan Taylor, Jim Ursay saga, if he's able to lead the team to, you know, double-digit wins in the division, that's a much better story than, like, I don't know, Arthur Smith getting to 11 wins with in spite of Desmond Ritter or Dennis <laughs> Allen leading the Saints to 12-5 and five against the worst schedule in football. Mm-hmm. Like, there is yeah. narrative kind of juice there yeah. for Shane Steichen. Uh, so, yeah, if you believe in the Colts, I would not be betting plus 275 for them to win the AFC South. I'd be betting Steich in it. You know, he's in the 15 to 1, 18 to 1 range for coach of the year. Uh, yeah. I think that's the best angle of attack yeah. with them. And also Anthony Richardson just gives you a lot of upside. Like no one knows what this guy is. Uh, yeah. And the signs were relatively promising uh, in the first, what, five, six quarters. Yeah. I, th- like. I think the only thing you got to look out for, all, all of those other kind of narratives, I, I I have a really tough time seeing any of them being really all that likely. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. The one that I think you got to keep an eye on is uh, uh, undefeated Shanty. Uh, yeah, that team. Well, they're well, not. Sure. They're not. They're not even playing that well, <laughs> and they're and they're embarrassing teams. Like this is this is a team that is going to continue to get better, and their schedule is all of a sudden looks uh, pretty doggone easy outside of a couple singular tests that they can get up for. Yep. No, I'm all for it. Career achievement. Shanahan, 15 and two, one seed, finishes two wins in front of the rest of the league, and McDaniel falls off. I think McDaniel is the tier one favorite by margin at the moment by himself. And then there's a tier two of Shanahan, LaFleur, Steichen, Dan mm-hmm. Campbell. He probably will need the one seed if McDaniel is a top two seed. But yeah, it's a bit of a mess. Outside of McDaniel, uh, McDaniel's going to be like plus 150 in the market if he wins in Buffalo. Um, yeah. But if he loses, then we're plunged into a bit of chaos. Uh, and I think guys like Shanahan and Steichen in particular uh, could be value. But I'm with you, Drew. And let me tell you, there is no <laughs> world in which Carl Shanahan wins Coach of the Year without me being uh, next to him on the podium, if uh, not in reality. Certainly- <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm all for that. All right, on that note, we are done. Don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks to those of you watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. Please rate and subscribe if you're listening as a podcast and a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports from Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick. We'll see you soon.